This video helps set the stage for two important early opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court, McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden. Both of these were written by Chief Justice John Marshall, and both involved the interaction between the national government and the state governments. Now, the combination of two levels of government was one of the genuine innovations in the U.S. Constitution. As James Madison put it, the new Constitution would be part national, creating a single nation with a central government, and part federal, creating a federation of states, where each one retained a significant amount of independence from each other and from the national government. Now, in today's terminology, the word federal typically refers to the national government. Madison's idea still remains. We have a system that is part national and part state. Figuring out how the national government and the state governments interact with each other was one of the earliest puzzles the nation needed to consider. And it remains an eternal debate that is revisited again and again. The general framework on this slide can be used to approach any constitutional question, whether it involves state law or federal law. The government must have a source of power, and that power cannot be used in a way that violates limits that are based on constitutional structure or on individual rights. But these categories play out a little differently for federal and state governments. When it comes to powers, the federal government only has power to enact laws on enumerated topics. By contrast, states may simply rely on their sovereignty as the source of power for a law on any topic. Now, when it comes to limits, the states face a structural limit that the federal government does not, and that's the limit of federal supremacy. Federal level laws are considered supreme, and they can override any conflicting state laws. So these are the concepts that are battled out in McCulloch and in Gibbons. Both cases call for the court to rule on the constitutionality of two different statutes, one of them federal and one of them state. The court needed to decide if either or both of the laws were constitutional which could be depicted on this diagram as a star falling fully inside a zone of government power symbolized by the vase. Procedurally, both cases began with a plaintiff arguing that a defendant violated state law. Now, in each case there wasn't really any dispute about that. The defendants had violated state law. So the case really hinged on the affirmative defenses raised by the defendants. Specifically, they argued that the state law was unconstitutional because it conflicted with a federal law. The plaintiffs then responded to that affirmative defense, and there were two arguments. First, Congress had no power to enact the federal law, and even if Congress had that power, the federal law should not be understood as a limit on the state law. So each of these opinions was structured to respond to the plaintiff's rebuttal of the affirmative defense. Each opinion was written in this order. The first topic in each opinion was whether Congress had enacted a valid law. Now, there weren't any arguments raised that the federal laws in these cases violated structural limits on the federal government or individual rights binding on the federal government. So the federal part of the opinion was limited to questions of enumerated power. Specifically, were any of the federal government's powers broad enough to allow Congress to enact this kind of law? If not, that would be the end of the affirmative defenses, and the case would pretty much be over. But if Congress did have power to enact the federal law, we would then need to move on to the second question. The second question involves reconciling the concurrent use of powers that each government possessed. As we've seen, the federal government has enumerated powers to enact laws on specific subjects, while states have power to enact laws on any subject. So this means that there may be some overlap, powers that both levels of government may exercise. You've undoubtedly experienced concurrent powers in your own life when you've paid both state and federal taxes on something. 
whether it's paying two taxes on the same gallon of gasoline or two taxes on the same income. The tax example shows that the federal and state governments could use their concurrent powers at the same time, and that's frequently allowed. But sometimes the uses of the powers within these areas of concurrent control will conflict with each other. So that's the kind of conflict that was also discussed in both McCulloch and Gibbons. In this diagram, let's assume that the federal statute was constitutional. So now let's move to the state law. In each case, the state government had a source of power to enact it. It's because states are sovereign, they can enact laws on any subject. However, a state cannot use its power in a way that violates structural limits, and this includes the limit imposed by the Supremacy Clause of the U.S. Constitution. The Supremacy Clause says that federal law is supreme, notwithstanding inconsistent state laws. So supremacy is a potential limit on state laws whenever we have activity in concurrent areas. So the strength of this structural limit on states became the second question to be addressed in both McCulloch and Gibbons.